Our last presenter um, for today is Rick Johnstone, um, who is an Ohio native um, and serves as president and founder of IVM Partners, which is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. He's also owner of VMES. Do you spell it out? Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, vegetation Management Consulting. He conducts vegetation management research and training under IVM Partners and is a liaison between federal, state, and tribal land management agencies, electric and natural gas utilities, universities, and conservationists. Under VMES, he provides utility vegetation management consultation and is an expert witness in litigation. So join me in welcoming Rick. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, IVM Partners, as Iris said, was uh, 501c3, and um, I formed it back in 2003 to have some entity act as a liaison between electric and gas utilities, the federal agencies, and conservation groups, because there was really nobody acting as that, and it was almost like nobody talks to each other. They have their own little meetings in their own silos and complain about each other. So I formed it to have the liaison and also to do research, what actually happens on right-of-ways. We have about 60 million acres of land that's in rights away in this country when you add them all together. And when you're looking at one species that's already listed in danger to one proposed, the problem that I see with the, this approach is we're trying to manage to a species versus managing to habitat that's conducive to that species. So I'll give you what got me on this. this is, I spent 25 years as the forester for Delmarva Power, which is the Chesapeake Bay. This is in Maryland when we first tried to control vegetation that had been on a mowing cycle. This was actually treated by a helicopter, then touched up on the ground and re-taken it back to a wetland meadow. And then I started seeing white fringed orchids popping up. So I called the Heritage Program in Annapolis. I said, where are they coming from? They said, well, we're finding out these plants can lie dormant up to 150 years. And it was usually fire because the Native Americans on the coastal plains set the woods on fire every year to drive game to harvest for winter. So it wasn't forest all the way across. It was big trees with prairie underneath. So when you're looking at trying to bring back habitat, and Frank Muddy's has been mentioned several times, what we've done is a combination. So we're doing a broadcast treatment of the Frank Muddy's, then burn the thatch layer in the winter, then touch it up with a backpack, and all those species came in. We didn't plant anything. When you're looking at a right-of-way, when you first mow it, it's just going to look like that every time you mow it. But if you manage it, you get a stable plant community of early successional plants, from grasses to forbs to shrubs. Those plants are competing for that growing space, and a lot of them produce their own herbicides, which is why Phragmites becomes a monoculture, because that thatch layer, it's leaching herbicides. Black walnut trees, you won't find other trees growing next to a grove of black walnuts because they leach a chemical called juglans. We want to take that and use that to our advantage. We also want to use the birds, the, the voles, and the field mice who are consuming the seeds that are constantly falling into that right away from the adjoining woods. So you provide habitat, wildlife's going to use it. Doing it this way, the red line was the cost of mowing with inflation. The green is what we actually spent over 25 years. So we saved seven and a half million dollars on 1,000 acres or 1,000 miles of electric transmission line. So IVM is that you want to manage that plant community to be compatible with whatever your objectives are, whatever type of land management you're doing. The control methods are the tools in the toolbox. How do you do it? So when you're looking at the different cutting techniques, then you've got the chemicals which help you get to the biological and the cultural controls. The best practice is use the right tool at the right time. So mowing is something that's accepted. People do it all the time. You see the mowers going down the highways. But mowing is not management. By itself, it's maintenance. And you have issues. We, you always hear about your carbon footprint, right? We've mentioned that a couple times today. What do you think we're burning when we run mowers? Hydrocarbons. Go into a wetland. You'll see where they tear up the soil. They also are leaking hydraulic fluid, oil, and fuel, which is contaminating the water. You don't see it, but it's happening. Then you open up the right-of-way and you invite these guys to come in and tear up all your customers' property, which makes them real happy. And then wildlife can't get out of the way of mowers, 
that turtle can't run from 3,000 RPM blades. And if you've got nesting birds, you're going to destroy those nests, which is why you're not supposed to mow between April 15th and August 15th in this part of the country for the Migratory Bird Act. Well, what do fawns do instinctively when danger approaches? They hunker down in the grass. That mower operator can't see them with that big mower, not until they're hamburger. These are the things that really happen out there. You take away all the vegetation, you get a heavy rain, it's going to wash down the slope. If you don't have a good buffer, it's getting into the water, affecting the fish, any wildlife using it. Mowing is difficult on steep slopes. They're hard to access. You have to get in there and hand cut. Very hazardous type of work, especially with snow and rocks and ice. When you have invasives, you're not going to control them with cutting. They're coming right back again. And when you get them along the streams, that's where they're going to congregate. You, they're going to drop a lot of seeds because they're very, very prolific, like this Brazilian pepper. And then what happens when you cut it? You did nothing to the root system. So you're going to get multiple sprouts coming back, which are then going to make it very difficult to access either electric or gas. And that's why you're, you're complaining because you're out of power for eight hours. And that's because they got to get a bulldozer to clear the transmission line to get a line truck back there to put the poles back up. These are the issues that really happen. So you need to look at herbicides, same way you look at if you're sick. If you're really sick and I've had Lyme disease, you need to get an antibiotic. That's the way I look at herbicides. When that ecosystem is sick, you need a chemical that's going to help get it back into a healthy state. So you can use different techniques and different chemicals, but once you get rid of those weed species, that opens that growing space for the desirable species, which is what you see here. You can see a little bit of the dead canes that were treated. This all came in naturally. I have never planted in my 40-year career of managing right-of-ways. You don't have to plant unless it's been cropped for 50 years and there's no seed bank. You've got a seed bank. All you need to do is allow it to come back. So I'm going to show you some of the techniques. When you come in, if it's been mowed a lot, you may have to do a broadcast treatment, which means you're going to spray everything on that right-of-way because there's really not a whole lot there you want at that particular time. Now, this is a study we did in Michigan. This is Stony Creek Metro Park. We worked with the superintendent there. We did a cutting and then treatments. 60 species of early successional plants came back. Blanding turtle came into the wetland. I showed that to the DNR in, in, uh, in Michigan, and they said, where'd you find that turtle? I said, out on the right away. He said, that's a rare turtle. I said, I don't know one from the other. I'm a forester. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know turtles, but they were back. They were trying to control spotted knapweed and Canada thistle. I said, well, well, we'll put a mix in the herbicide treatment to take those out. The right-of-way was sprayed, off the right-of-way was not. You see that purple, that pink plant, that's spotted knapweed. You can't control with fire, you have to use herbicides. But not only did we control that, Bob White quail came back. I, and the, I told the refuge manager, I kicked one out, and he said, where'd you find a quail? And I said, where we sprayed. He said, we have had a quail in eight years. I said, you haven't had habitat in eight years. Bring it and they'll come. Here's another study. This is Willow Metro Park, south of uh, Detroit. It was all European buckthorn and autumn olive. This is two months after mowing. It's already got viable seeds on it. So we did a broadcast treatment followed by selective treatment. And we split the right away. The left side we treated, the right we did not. Here's the left side the second year. Here's the right side the second year. Here's two more years. Which one do you want? Left is easy to do maintenance on that line. The right, they better do something quick or you're going to have an outage. So this is in Maryland. This is Patuxent Wildlife Refuge. They wanted help with converting it over. A weekend, we were working with quality deer management. They wanted to do food plots. I said, let me use herbicides, see what we get. They had uh, Lespedeza, which is often used for erosion control on construction, gets in very dense. That's what it looked like with a herbicide treatment. We didn't plant anything. It's warm season grasses, and we're back to our native forbs. The, the deer hunters didn't have to plant anything. So the chemistry that we're using, we have a lot of different herbicides now that are not Roundup, which is what everybody says when you say herbicide, say Roundup. I said, well, we'll use a little bit because you have to use rodeo in a wetland. But most of the time, we don't use it. We're using 
chemistry that's very selective so that we can allow these plants to come back and provide the habitat. Now electric and gas, similar issues with trying to manage vegetation, only you're worried about underground instead of above ground. This is a project they did with, um, uh, it was nice source then, Columbia Gas, and it was Brian Cordham who had to leave because he had to go to a funeral, but he had asked me to come in. This is 10 years ago, and he said, Army Corps of Engineers won't let us use any herbicides. This is uh, J. Percy Priest Lake in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So I met with the Army Corps and I went over how we can manage and they said, well, this sounds good, let's, let's do it. We, we have 35,000 acres, this will improve our wildlife habitat. I said, well, what did they propose you didn't want to do? And they said, well, they wanted to spray by helicopter and they wanted to use the chemical Tordon, Picloram. I said, I would have said no. I said, this is a recreational lake. There's people who are boating, fishing. There's a campground right next to it. You don't get much snow and ice in Nashville. The brush is 15 feet tall. It's going to stand there a long time, and you're going to get a lot of complaints. The other is you can't use Tordon and karst soils where you have limestone soil. You've got sinkholes. It's not registered for that. We have herbicides registered for this. So we mowed it first because it was too tall. Then we did a broadcast treatment, followed the next year with a, a backpack, and we took habitat that looked like that when we started to that. And you see milkweed there. We did not plant milkweed. It just came in. So the, the butterflies are enjoying the right-of-ways now. So you're providing energy to the public as well as pollinator habitat that's all just native habitat coming in. When you mow it right away, that's what it looks like. That's the same area but on the mainland. So I asked the gas company, I said, don't mow this this year. They mow it every year. I said, don't mow it. Let's see what happens. Stop mowing in the the blue are the forbs, the wildflower. The green is grass. You see in one year, the number of forbs basically doubled. Stop cutting their heads off and they'll bloom. Okay? So then they had an issue needing to get down the right away because they have stuff with um, some of the forbs are too tall. They need to see those markers. And then you have things like Johnson grass, which is eight feet tall. So we sprayed the bands and then we just did a workshop in August, and that's Lee Atkins with Progressive Solutions. I said, we want something so the guys can just walk from pylon to pylon. It'll spray 12 feet behind them and provide a, a path so you have you can get to your pylons, but all the forbs can grow in between. So you have a pipe zone and a border zone. We did work down with a naval midstream down in Arkansas. And this is right outside of the Washita National Forest, which we're working on an EA with them to allow herbicides. So the National Forest is our control area. But this is the side where we treated. You see when it was mowed on the left and then three years later. This is the National Forest side, and you see how dense that gets. Same period of time, and it gets more and more dense, plus you're losing your access. When you talk about trying to grow something with mowing, Look underneath those trees. There's no sunlight getting on that soil. There's no way a, a wildflower can grow under there. That's the type of thickness you get. The other thing we can do with herbicides is the FERC rule for the gas pipelines is when you cross a wetland, you can mow the 10 feet wide where the pipe pylon is, but on the side you have to leave that until something gets to be 15 feet tall, then you can cut it out. The problem is your invasives are in there. So buckthorn, autumn olive, uh, depending on where you are, you've got to have your own pipe. Here we came in, we did herbicides to keep stuff low where the pipe is, and then allow, in this case, was viburnum shrubs, and you see the wildflowers coming in. Again, being selective with the chemistry, selective with the application. From those treatments, we formed a partnership with, with Arkansas Natural Heritage, um, and we have an area where they have corkwood shrub, which is a threatened species of uh, shrubs in, in uh, both Arkansas and Missouri. They were going they had actually talked about treating it. I said, it's too tall. You need to come in and mow it first, then treat it. So we mowed it last winter, and that's this summer. You can see how tall the stuff is already. Not only did we keep the corkwood, which you see on the right, but marshmallow it came in all over, and we're protecting that. When you're looking at what is the effect, I put this program together under my consulting company. 
um, and, and try to get them from mowing. They were on a three-year mowing cycle. We're basically on a three-year selective treatment cycle. So far, they've done 7,000 acres in four years. Now, I just gave a presentation two weeks ago in Little Rock for the Arkansas Pollinator Summit of how they're going to put their plan together. And they wanted to have 3,500 acres of right-of-way in pollinator habitat by the year 2023. I said, you better up your ante. We've got 7,000 already in four years that you don't even know about. So this is what the potential is. They're also interested because of the Migratory Bird Act and the FERC regulations. So here's their actual budget. They were spending a million dollars a year mowing on a three-year cycle. They figured they had to invest 20% more for three years. So 1.2 million for three years because you can't mow it and then wait the three years and spray it. You saw how big and dense it was. So you're going to mow it, you're going to come back the next year like we did in Nashville, and then you're going to touch it up. After that three years, now you're on a management program. You're again going to be every three or four years with a backpack, not a mower. So after the three years of investing 200000 more a year, or a total of 600000 they are going to save 50% of their budget through perpetuity. So they're going to save $500,000 a year forever. I think that's a pretty good investment in any business. So when you're looking at IVM, for the utilities, the highways, we're looking at site distance, access, reliability, safety. When you're talking to consumers, like Rob just mentioned, it's first time you're getting everybody excited because you're talking about bees and butterflies and mom and apple pie and those kinds of things. That's what the public is interested. They expect when they flip that switch, they're going to have electric. When you don't, they, they, they don't hesitate to let you know about it. So when you're trying to get the public involved, this is what we did with the, in, in Michigan. The park partnered with us and said, we want to educate people. We get a couple thousand people on this nature trail every day. So they explained what was going on and how, how the utility was working with them. So they have a couple pictures there, and this is the area. The wetland was all Norway maple, which is displacing our native sugar maple. So they wanted to get rid of it. The utility topped it all the time because they figured, we're in a park, we can't cut down trees. And I said, did you ever talk to them and, and work with them? So we took out the trees. Some we, we just stripped down, and we did what's called a, a, a hack and squirt, where we make a cut and we spray herbicide into the cut, kill it where it stands. Here's when it opened up the wetland. You see all the herbaceous plants immediately germinate, and that's what it ended up looking like. So you leave those snags there, which, again, that's habitat for bats. Indiana bats, they're going into the bark. You're leaving that for them. We did restoration. In, in Maryland, I'm in the dark shirt on the right. In the white shirt is Rich Mason, the biologist for U.S. Fish and Wildlife for the Chesapeake Bay region. He's explaining to the crowd the benefits they're seeing on the right of way. So this is with Baltimore Gas and Electric. You see where they had cut it. We did a, a herbicide so that we basically are bringing back the native prairie with shrubs on the side. And then in the ravines, instead of just spraying everything, we're being selective so that it holds the soil, provides good habitat, and helps prevent invasive plants from coming in. He asked, could we help with Phragmites control? We said, no problem. So we see it treating the Phragmites, taking it out, and then managing those wetlands back to native species. They documented 120 species of birds. Not only are the birds that like an open area, like the prairie warbler on the left, but the interior dwelling species, the FIDs, which they always complain about if you cut a right away, you're taking away contiguous forest, which you are. But what Fish and Wildlife found out is they may nest in the forest, but they feed in the right of way because baby chicks need caterpillars caterp and grasshoppers and bugs. You can put out all the bird feeders you want. Chicks can't eat seeds that are in bird feeders. Only adults can. So they need this type of habitat. They documented 147 species of native bees, 40 species of butterflies. This is on an electric right-of-way. 
And Sam Drogi, who's the pollinator expert for USGS, he said, in this field tour, you're standing probably the best pollinator habitat of the mid-Atlantic. This is two years after the first herbicide treatment. So we also, you say, well, okay, you could do that in an area that's a refuge or out in the country. What are you going to do in the cities? This is Columbia, Maryland, which is the bedroom community of Washington, D.C. It's just north of the Beltway. They were mowing the accessible areas twice a year, and everybody was happy with that. But to get into compliance with FERC regulations so you don't have an outage, bg and &E had to go in and cut in the wetlands. Well, people went ballistic, right? Now, I always say in every community, there's a little old lady in tennis shoes who's the ringleader. That's Elaine. <laughs> but Elaine was open to it, and her husband worked with Audubon and heard what we did at Wildlife Refuges. So we had community meetings, and then we put up a sign saying, as of October the 1st, and this is 2009, we're no longer going to be mowing. We're going to be applying herbicides. Here's why. Here's what we're doing. Here's an 800 number if you have any questions. It went to the utility, it went to the Columbia Association, and went to Howard County, which is where they are. Then we did the treatments. Now, in the workshop, I explained some of the stuff we're going to have to do in this transition, it is going to look like hell in the springtime. I'm going to tell you up front. This is a site two years after it was cut. Alanthus, Tree of Heaven, it's 18 feet tall, two years of growth. If we cut it, if you know Atlantis, it's a root suckering plant. So if you cut one, you're going to get 100. So we didn't want to do that. I said, we need to spray it, but it's going to look bad. But give us a growing season. There's the nature trail right in the front. So that's what it'll look like in the fall after we treat it. That's what hell looks like. But that's what it'll look like at the end of the growing season. So nobody complained because they, we were up front. Here's in the wetland. We did that selectively. You see the swamp milkweed coming in. That, that just came up. There's a pipeline that runs through. This is when it was cut. And the gentleman down there with the orange hard hat is treating us a uh, sycamore tree. It's 12 feet tall in one growing season. But that's what it'll look like the next summer. That's what it'll look like five years later. All we did in the meantime is go in our backpacks and touch it up. They had planted some kusa dogwood as ornamentals. You couldn't see it on the left. We got rid of the junk and left the kusa. That's how selective we can be. Then we leave an area for the workshops where we can show people, this is what was here. This is what it would look like if we didn't do what we're doing. So we, everything was mowed, and then the left side was treated. The right was not. There's one cycle. Then we mowed it again and treated it. That's what it looks like. That's the boat site. So the invasives in the trees will continue to dominate and when you mow it you will get one growing season of relief where your forbs will come up. The next year the invasives take over but worse than before because their root system is bigger. This is the IVM side. You never completely get rid of them. You don't annihilate them because uh, well, like John Goodfellow mentioned earlier this morning, you know, stuff is little. You're not going to see that when you're out there with a backpack. The next cycle, you'll pick it up. So they're always there, but they're not an issue. And that's what it looks like. And I take people on the, on the field tour, and I go, on the left is herbicides, on the right is not. Which one do you want in your community? One of the, the uh, groups that I invited to this workshop was the Maryland Public Service Commission. When they saw what was possible, on the left there is, this is a windmill project. And when you build wind turbines, you need a generator lead line, take the power from the windmills and get it into the grid so you, you can have it. So it's got to go to a substation. They were going to build this line, the wind turbines in Pennsylvania and tie it into Maryland in the mountains. And the Maryland Public Service Commission said, you can build it right away in Maryland, but you have to manage it with IVM afterwards. And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. So they told them to give me a call, and I put the program together, and the guys on the right, we were just touching it up two weeks ago. So when the, when the regulators understand that habitat is possible simply by how you manage, that's going to help drive it. Some utilities will spray, and then they'll come back, and they mow everything down because there's dead cane standing. We don't want people to see that. They're going to complain. Well, your native bees don't... They, they don't nest in big hives. Those are honeybees, which are 
foreigners, really. They're from Europe. They're not from here. Our native bees nest in these stems. You'll see the holes in it where they bore in, or they go in bare ground. So now the, the public sees the, the benefits. They're seeing birds. Elaine called me up and said, I just saw a couple out there with their eight-year-old son explaining what you guys are doing. And then we put signs up, different areas on the nature trail for continuing education. That way you're, you're helping the public and also understanding how we can do this. So we took the area that was being mowed, managed it to native plants, and that became a, wilt, a milkweed grove. And again, we didn't plant any milkweed, so the pollinators are benefiting from it. Now when you get out west, you know we just had a heck of a lot of fires in California. That's another issue you have to contend with out, out in the western states. You got to get rid of ladder fuels, pinyon pines, junipers. You can cut and reclaim the right of way, and this is New Mexico. We just cut it, and then we got lupin flowers coming in, which will provide habitat for the Carner blue butterfly. You got other wildflowers, but they're only going to last one growing season if we don't treat it, because you can't get rid of a pinyon pine because they grow the branches start so low you can't cut that low unless you get a herbicide on. And the oaks. So this is a side-by-side -side we did near where that fire killed all the hotshot crews that are making a movie right now, getting ready to come out. This is Prescott, Arizona. Prescott National Forest, we didn't have a permit. Everything was cut. We sprayed the outside. Prescott had to get cut again in 2014. So that's the left side of the fence, and on the right is where we treated. That's before it was cut in 14. That's the next year. Where we sprayed, this is what it looks like. You got better grasses, you got wildfires, you got low growing plants, you got cool burning plants, so that right away can act as a fire break so the hotshot crews can backfire from there. And we allow, because we're selective, we're letting uh, the uh, cliff rose come in as additional pollinator plants. So you end up with better habitat, providing for a lot of different pollinators. And because of that, you can work with the tribal nations. This is the Navajo Nation. We put together a plan there. The Navajo EPA gave us a grant to help work with them to improve grazing because it's overgrazed. So it's improving grazing. And then also what habitat you have on the, on the uh, arroyos where you've got salt cedar and Russian olive. We're taking those out, which again allows the native plants like Rocky Mountain bee plant to come back and provide habitat, and then other things that are pollinators like the honeybee or, or the uh, hummingbird. The wildlife habitats improve, which again, like we see all those elk at the bottom, mammal food and bedding, they use the right-of-ways. Here's a moose going across the right-of-way, black bears, a, a host of, of animals. I used to get asked by Quail Unlimited and, and Pheasants forever, can you do some plantings? Well, on Del Mar, I said, I don't need to plant. We'll bring the habitat back. Raptors, they're going to come in because those wolves and field mice are out there. Now, we also developed a pollinator site value index. And I think it was proposed, uh, David Spack from uh, Dr. Spack gave this to the last meeting we had. We're working on this with a grant from Baird. We're looking at those different plants, our primary sources of pollen and nectar. Yeah, you can do all these plantings, but how do the bees and butterflies feel about it? It may look pretty to us, right? Just like what we said about in Ohio. That looked nice, but it didn't really help. So on this index, we have a total of 2,000. That's too hard for you guys to really see, probably, but we're going through where is it, what type of plants are coming in there. The maximum value is 2,000. So I'm just going to show you an example. This is autumn olive and Lespedee as a control. This is in the refuge. This is when it was treated. And that's when it came back. And again, you see milkweed. So when it was treated, its value was only 46 out of 2,000 because it was invasive. It's now 690 out of 2,000. All we did was spray it and allow the natives to come back. And then we used selective treatments to keep it that way. We just, last week, we're down in Durham, North Carolina. This is studies we have there. You see before, and this is only two years, and this is we were treating an area of Lespedeza and uh, honeysuckle. That's when we treated it. This is the next spring. That's last fall. That's last week. 
So we just looked at what are the plants now, this time of year, like asters are important. So there was 8% goldenrod, 2% asters when it was treated in 2015. It's now 5% bone set, 30% dog fennel, 60% asters, or basically 95% of restored habitat without planting anything. So we went from a value of 28 for nectar and 36 for pollen to 220 and 190 for pollen. So you're looking at what's the benefit of that providing a food source because yes, monarchs need milkweed. Lay their eggs on it, their larvae eat it. But this time of year, it ain't blooming, it's in pods. What are they gonna eat? I just left the Chesapeake Bay two days ago. The, the butterflies, the monarchs are all con congregating before they cross the bay and head down to Mexico. They're looking for forbs. Well, I got studies with Dr. Gabe Carnes in Ohio on the shell gas right away. They, they wait until that Migratory Bird Act and then they mow all the right away. They mow down all the forbs. So this is working with them. They also had a feed a bee grant with Bear. Here where you see all the uh, goldenrod, he's spraying with a backpack, treating an autumn olive bush, not touching anything else. The monarchs are right there feed, as well as the bees. Federal strategy on pollinators, if you've read it, it's in there about working with utilities and looking at your regulations. I want to give you a couple things you probably haven't heard of. You look in your city, Chicago, I guarantee you there's a grass height ordinance. The utility has to mow their right of ways, can't let anything get above 10 inches so that you don't have vagrant lots. We worked with inner city Baltimore. Now you, you get to these inner city communities, they don't have money to take their kids on field tours. This right away goes right through. It says, stop mowing it. We'll do treatments. You'll have an area where the kids can come out and study the birds and the butterflies and everything. There's milkweed popping up. All we did was stop mowing. Then we went in there with backpacks. How many acres are in the city? That could be basically linear parks crisscrossing this city in any city you're in. I'm speaking to uh, in two weeks to the Maryland Conservation Service, uh, Department of Agriculture. Conservation Reserve Program lands around the ag fields. They're all upset in Maryland and Delaware because calorie pear, sweet gum, autumn olive, multiflor rose pop right up. They mow them every year. They said, well, actually, Fish and Wildlife came to me. You do it on a right of way. Why can't you do it around an ag field? I said, we could. So ag fields, the, uh, we're at sea level, so all those drainage ditches, all that can be treated. And there's habitat next to the crops. So the, the CRP land and the right-of-ways can provide pollination to the crops to improve on yield. Landfills, this is one we did with Wildlife Habitat Council. It, it was a Superfund site. We went in, took out the invasives, and brought back the native plants. You do your planting, really all that you have to do, digging the soil, spraying it, coming back and spraying it again, then planting, fertilizing. You're going to spend about $10,000 an acre. I don't think anybody in here has enough money to do very many acres. If you're at roadside, do it at a rest stop to tell people this is what we're doing. But on the right-of-ways, take those open areas instead of trees. Let it go to pollinator plants. This is in Maryland. We have a Roadside Tree Act and the um, Chesapeake Bay program. They say you got to plant trees. They plant trees along the highway, then they got to mow around them. I said, you ain't protecting anything. Then you mow all the way to the fence because the state owns to the fence. That back area behind that swale can be managed just like a right of way out of the utilities. Here's one we did in Alabama. They had invasive privet trees. We took them out. Here we're doing the treatment on a, on a tree, but it, we're saving a sumac. Now, they want sumac right next to the road, but on the back slope, why not? We don't have our southeastern pine savanna anymore. All these clover leaves. This is Louisiana. Quit mowing around. Let it come back into prairie underneath. It'll you'll restore that pine savanna. Marilyn, I told them, stop mowing. See what you get. 51 species came in. Florida, we stopped an area. This is Lake City, Florida. 40 species of plants came in. 
Then we just come in and we take out what we don't want. So the utilities can also partner with the DOT. This is on, this is Maryland. You see everybody's mowing everything, right? Like somebody's front yard. Here's what it should look like. Mow down to the swale, manage that right away as habitat. Here's a partnership. We just did a workshop two weeks ago with the electric co-op. The state highway was mowing. We said, stop mowing, and here's what you got. We took people out there and demonstrated the backpacks. So, sum up, mowing and hand cutting can only maintain the vegetation. Cutting will spread the invasives. Herbicides are necessary to reclaim and restore. Planting is usually not needed. Milkweed is there. It's called a weed, right? Milkweed. It's going to come in. Forbs are going to provide the nectar and the pollen. And the biological controls are provided by the animals and the plants that you leave there. It's going to save money, and you can use it at any type of land management. So we've got some of the studies on our website. Uh, you got my contact there, too. That's my cell number. Feel free to call me. Be glad to work with you. Thank you.